Hello, this is David D. Hilster. I'm a critical thinker, science dissident, and I'm here to tell you the truth about science. Something your university professor won't tell you, the mass media t won't tell you, and certainly those science evangelists won't tell you. Maybe this is a better symbol, like a, you know, one of those, what do they call those, halos? Like they're some kind of gods or whatever. Um, <clears throat> anyways, we're going to talk about today one of my favorite subjects. Everybody knows in this community, community, just say neutrinos and David gets set off. Well, the reason I do is because people don't read the great people who have come before us and who spent many, many more years on subjects to find answers for us that we can read and agree with or we can disagree with. But in this case, we can agree with because this person spent a lot of time. I'm talking about my mentor, Dr. K Ricardo Carazani. Um, you can read about all of this stuff at neutrinos.autodynamics.org. And you can go to this page and it will tell you everything you know about why neutrinos don't exist. Show data that of the, how the neutrino is not a science. It's voodoo. You can explain experimental results without the need for neutrinos. And he even found... Carazon even found in 1946 published in Physics Review an experiment that proves the existence, uh, the non existence of the electron neutrino, which is supposedly the, the most well known neutrino and most stable, whatever you want to call it. But it, like the rest of particle physics, is a mess and is invented. Now, the reason I'm talking not only to people in the mainstream science who believe in neutrinos and Higgs bosons and all these other things that were invented, quarks which were invented, strings which were invented, this is also for the dissidents because dissidents like to look for what gravity is, what light is, what electromagnetism is, all those kinds of things. And so they go looking around and maybe a mysterious particle will fill their need. Well, the neutrino seems to fill the need of the dissident just almost as much as mainstream science. And when I point them in this direction, they go, well, this is your opinion. It isn't an opinion because it's pretty much the history of where the neutrino was supposedly uh, invented by Karazani. So if you don't read this, you can pretend it exists. Or you can read this and go on. Because when we all, when we throw out almost all of particle physics in the near future, and neutrinos go, and you're a dissident, and your model shows neutrinos, uh-oh, what do you do? And the neutrino is the most ridiculous particle anyways. If you look at all the particles, this one is ridiculous. It flies through the universe and changes its type. There are million, There's bunches of types of them. Sometimes they discover what they think is a neutrino, and it's too big. It won't fit in. They, they Oh, it just goes on and on. But we're going to try to cover most of it in this talk today. The origin of the neutrino. We're going to go down here to the very bottom. And we're going to look at where the neutrinos postulated. Basically, radioactivity or decay. There are some things like radium E, which I think is bismuth, uh, and goes to polonium. That is basically, if you look at uh, radiation or radioactivity, radium E decays to polonium. That is, if you give it five days, half of it will go from radium to polonium. That's because out of the atom, an electron is ejected because it's not real stable. You can, of course, measure the uh, um, heat from this and calculate how much energy is really coming out of this. How is this postulated? Well, it turns out that it's special relativity. Special relativity, the one that says mass increases as you get closer to the speed of light. The same thing that uh, that's Einstein's special relativity. Well, there's a real big problem. In my film documentary, Einstein Wrong, there's a, a guy named, a, a, a experimentalist named Dr. Kessley, who on camera says, we do not observe mass increase. It's not there. Therefore, if you don't find it, special relativity has to be thrown out. It's no good. So, but that doesn't matter. So back in the uh, early part of this, the 20th century, you had people like Pauli saying, okay, if you have special relativity and electrons are coming out of radium E in at the 0.86 the speed of light, which is pretty darn fast, there's going to be an increase of energy, an increase of mass, which is energy, and therefore we're going to have to see an increase, more than just the electron and, excuse me, energy coming out. 
But what happens? They measure it. They say that there's going to be 0 0.36 million electron volts per atom in the radium E. What do they measure? Exactly that. 0 0.36 million electron volts per atom. But no, 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 Polly says, if you guys believe in this crazy idea of mass increase and Einstein's crazy special relativity, I'm putting the crazy part in, of course, it's going to have to be 1.16 million electron volts. And you have a big problem. We are measuring less than that. Point, we're measuring 0 0.08 million electron volts minus, uh, less. What do you do? Oh, let's call, the, call it a neutron. That's what, of course, Pauli wanted to call it. But if neutron was taken, he dies. Fermi comes along and says, Fermi, okay, we're going to call it the neutrino. And voila, it was born. If you ask a guy from the mainstream, particle physicists, they're all going to argue against this. Why? Because they don't look at it. They don't go and study history. They didn't spend years and years and years like Karazani trying to unravel this problem because he knows special relativity doesn't exist. And he's trying to find out where did this come from? Well, the, it's a circular argument in the mainstream now. What they say is the equation needs it because we use special relativity in all our equations. And with it, if we use special relativity in all our equations, we need the neutrino. Of course you do. It's got to make up for the magical energy. And it's a magical particle because it can go through 100,000 light years of lead without interacting. Boy, that sounds normal. And oh, by the way, it flies through space and changes type without any provocation. In fact, neutrino scientists are not exactly the most well-respected scientists in particle physics. Not too many people go in that direction. So in general, the neutrino is the bad boy, no good, worst poster child of a particle that exists in the, part, in, the, in, in the fantasy particle physics world, which most all of it can be thrown out. So that's where it comes from. So what happens? Karazani shows special relativity wrong. He shows that wrong. If you're interested in that, you can read about that. But he also found out later, he says, okay, what is any, anybody done an experiment to see if this whole hypothesis is right or wrong? Well, it turns out he finds a place. It's here on our website by Buchner and Van de Graaff. Van de Graaff. Remember the Van de Graaff machine? Eh, slightly uh, respected. This is from the MIT. Well, slightly respected. Published in 1946 that shows that the electron neutrino does, in fact, not exist. Let's just take a look at it. Here's this experimental setup of the calorimeter. They're measuring calories, which is actually in heat. And then they plot this curve. And you see it's a straight line. Now, what that means is, is the more that's coming out, it's not getting that, that curve in it, because if it did, special relativity would give us a curve. It's a straight line. He ran it even for... Uh, in a couple of times in different different uh, ways. But let's just get to the conclusion. You can read it on your own. We are glad to acknowledge, well, where is it? Okay, here it is. It appears that the large energy losses, which the neutrino is, which have been previously reported, cannot be accounted for by the suggested emission of neutrinos or other extremely penetrating radiation. No, we don't read this one. This one doesn't count. They don't do this experiment very often, if at all. Yeah, because it wouldn't exactly. They'd have to give. They'd have to take back their Nobel prizes for neutrino, which they gave into in nineteen um, ninety-five. Now you may ask, oh well, they have neutrino detectors. This is so easy to answer. Uh, Karazani is a. Is a amazing mind, one of the smartest guys I've ever known, and he answers the question about neutrino detectors this way. Why do they shield neutrino detectors? Why do they put them under mountains? Why do they put them in the Antarctic? Why do they put them in caves? Why do they put them in mines? To shield them from false hits. Hmm. And a friend of mine, I'm not my, Meyer, said, oh, the perfect new she the neutrino detector shield will yield no neutrino detections. So what they're detecting are they know they can detect false hits 
that's what they're detecting false hits. In fact, hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of gallons of basically what looks like um, um, wind, windshield wipe, wiper fluid in Canada. I think I, I don't remember exactly. Don't quote me on it. But they come back in one of these. Uh, I saw a video of these guys and they had a. Uh, we, we've collected 36 argon atoms that are proof, and that's over a month, 36 argon atoms. You can probably find 36 argon atoms in almost any mass after a month that you pick up. But no, these are definite proof in this liquid form, which of course, it can't be perfect. We, we are not that perfect in our experimentation. So neutrinos are crazy, impossible, attributes to them going through th 100,000 light years of lead, yet we can detect them, yet we, we can detect them even though we're trying to shield them from false hits, and how do we know that those aren't false hits? We know that mass increase doesn't happen. It's documented on film by experimental physicists at Stanford Linear Accelerator. We know Karazani shows special relativity to be wrong, and we now know where the neutrino comes from because when you use relativistic kinematics, that is, kinematics is our equations for, for kinetics, hitting stuff. If we use relativistic ones, we have to have the neutrino. They don't balance out, of course, because the relativity requires uh, extra and magical energy. You take that out, and we have also neutrino. We have the ability to explain neutrinos, non-neutrino, we have the ability to explain things like nuclear and nuclear collision without neutrinos using the mistake found in Einstein by Karazani. Nuclear and nuclear collision and other things can be explained at the particle physics level without the neutrino using the corrected special relativity to get out the, the, uh, get out the magic from out of that equation. So if you are a dissident <coughs> and refuse this, if you are the mainstream and refuse to read it, it's your own problem. You're relegating yourself to obscurity. You can sit there and close your eyes and close your eyes and plug your ears and pretend and hum that this doesn't exist, but Karazani's done great work. You read it, you understand it, it makes sense, but I have people in our group, in our CNPS, the John and Chappelle Natural Philosophy Alliance saying, well, Dave, I've read it, but I don't subscribe to that. <laughs> so, <laughs> what does that mean? It basically means I've read it. it, it it's total logical. Um, it seems factual, but I don't believe it. That's your problem if you believe in these things. People believe in things instead of reading the facts for themselves. So, that's enough for today. I went way too far. Uh, but I hope you get a good introduction to why the neutrino doesn't exist and a lot of other problems. They're, they're all interrelated. So that's all I have for now. And remember, don't take what anyone says on faith. Stay critical, stay thinking. I'm Dave DeHilster, your science therapist. Ciao for now.